Um, so ha having um, this morning, I, I suppose, really try to, you know, inspire everybody, um, we now want to turn our attention to the kind of practicalities of working with artists. So what I'm going to do is, is um, run through a very, very quick PowerPoint presentation about some of the things you might just want to keep in mind. Um, and this is probably all terribly obvious, and you probably know all this already, but you know, sometimes um, it, it does no harm to, to state the, <laughs> the obvious. Um, so I, I suppose, as, as Emma said earlier on, um, when you're sort of thinking about a project that involves artists, if, if you're a museum curator, or if you're an artist who wants to approach a museum with a project, um, you know, you really have to think about what, what you're trying to do, why, why, you're, why you are making a proposal, what, 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 is, what are you wanting to achieve in the long term. Um, and there are many different things that you might be wanting to do. You might be wanting to, um, you know, develop and exhibit a new body of work, um, if you're a curator, you might be wanting to find a new way of curating and interpreting and explaining um, a collection and, and the ideas that uh, underpin it. Um, your, your aim might be more to do with audiences. You know, this might, might essentially be a kind of audience development exercise. And you might even want to be embarking on some sort of process of organisational change. Um, and a, a number of people in their presentations have um, hinted at the ways in which um, working with an artist can actually push an organisation to change its, its way of thinking, um, its way of thinking about collections or maybe its way of thinking about audiences as well. Um, when I met up with Ilana and um, Helen yesterday, Ilana was um, t telling me about um, you know, the, Im the impact really that you've had on the way that Shrewsbury has conceived its new museum. Um, we can maybe talk about that a bit later, but um, yeah, um, because the architect had a very particular approach in mind, rather prescriptive, rather didactic, and you've encouraged him to abandon that really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. So, you know, organizational change might be one of the things that you're you're trying to achieve. Um, obviously if you want to make a funding application, uh, either to the Arts Council or to any other um, funding body, um, you you need to know what you're going to be asking um, an artist to do, and that involves writing uh, a brief or for the purposes of a funding application writing an indicative brief you know re really sort of touching on the things that you you want your project to um, achieve um, and again this is all but terribly obvious really but <laughs> I, and I'm sure there are lots of templates out there on the web that you, you can use but the main elements of a brief are the background to your organisation um, you know, you need to talk about what, how, how this particular project fits into a larger um, trajectory or sort of developmental process. You need to explain explicitly what you're trying to achieve, you know, what your hopes uh, are for the project. Um, state who is managing it, who will be involved. You need to make sure that um, the artist or artists have uh, a single main point of contact, somebody that they can talk to and work through, um, because museums, as I'll suggest in a minute, can be quite kind of daunting, complicated um, organisations. Um, you obviously, when you um, write a, a brief um, and circulate it, you need to give some indication of your timetable, budget, um, fees, and you need to explain the, the selection process. Um, and then another really important point, and I think again this has been mentioned already, 
um, be prepared for your brief to change because once you're actually in the situation of working with an artist, um, you, I'm sure you know, that things will change. Um, you may not end up quite with the project you thought you were going to get. Um, and I think, um, I mean, often museums are not very um, flexible institutions, um, but maybe they should be. Maybe they should be slightly more prepared to um, kind of change their, their um, fixed ways of doing things. Um, there are so many places you can advertise a brief. Um, the main one probably is the Arts Council's Arts Jobs um, site, um, which is an absolutely fantastic free service. Anybody can advertise a job through the, the, um, the Arts Council. Uh, we um, have an, an Opportunities Notice Board. You can use AXIS. Um, uh, we usually have about 200 opportunities on the website at any given moment. It's completely free to advertise on our site and uh, we can even, if you like, we can try and match you up with artists. We can target artists with um, uh, email alerts about your opportunity. Um, AN, what used to be Artist Newsletter, another great place to um, advertise. They, they also um, are very well used by the kind of artist community. Um, ArtQuest, um, which is a website for um, artists in London, but also has lots and lots of really useful resources on it, um, is also worth bearing in mind. Um, and the, all the web addresses are in your information pack, incidentally. And then there are other places like The Guardian, if you've you know, if you're willing to spend a bit of money, it costs quite a lot to advertise on The Guardian. And you, you know, it rather depends on, I suppose, the sort of status of your project, the size of the project and how big a budget you have. Um, and then there's the Contemporary Visual Arts Network, which is a network of um, artists and visual arts organisations in each region, um, sort of funded by the Arts Council, um, and most of those regional um, networks have got um, um, some sort of you know, email bulletin service. Um, so it's, I think it's always worth um, keeping the Contemporary Visual Arts Network in mind. And then if, if your project is more in the kind of nature of a public art project, then it's worth thinking about Ixia, um, which um, is a kind of think tank for public art but also now runs a, a very good website called Public Art Online. So those are the places where you can disseminate um, any opportunity. Thinking about a budget, which is obviously going to be your main consideration, um, these are just some of the things that you need to keep in mind. Um, recruitment, it's the thing that I have to say, I always forget to budget for. Um, so um, if you're interviewing artists, you might need to cover their travel expenses, for example. Um, you will obviously, or you might want to pay for advertising your opportunity as well. So that, uh, you do need to set aside some budget for that. Planning time. Um, I mean, but, uh, people do need to be paid for the time they take in planning something it's not just about delivery it is about the the kind of the thinking time the reading time the time to absorb information the time to get to know the collections in the museum um, then obviously there's travel and accommodation um, which can eat up a very large amount of budget um, things like equipment materials fabrication and display um, and then delivery, I hate the word delivery, it's such a kind of bureaucratic word, isn't it? But I'm not, well, delivery or implementation, that's probably almost just as bad, isn't it? But you know what I mean, it's the kind of bit in the middle where the important things are happening. Um, and then marketing, communications, uh, preview, launch, whatever you want to call it, um, documentation and then probably review at the end as well you know it's important to kind of take time and look back and think about what worked what you might do differently next time 
So this was something we talked about um, this morning, that there are so many ways in which you can find artists, um, so many ways in which you can recruit artists. I mean, if you're actually looking for an artist, I do think that Axis is a good place to start. And I, I, I honestly, I did look at other portfolio websites <laughs> when I was thinking about this talk and I actually thought you know there are none of them very good ours is much the best <laughs> so I hope you'll forgive me that uh, that plug but um, it is the best because we um, uh, this is going to sound terribly immodest but but there is a selection process so it's not open to every artist by every mean by any means um, and we do try to document and represent and promote work that is genuinely of the moment and that we feel is sort of pushing at um, boundaries and it is in some way experimental. So access is not necessarily a platform for artists working in more traditional ways, shall, shall we say. Um, it has very good search and filter mechanisms and, and um, in fact the search facility is about to become dramatically better when we launch our new website in the middle of April. Um, and you can also ring us up and talk to us and we will try to do a little bit of sort of matchmaking for you because we're not just a website, we're an organisation as well and we, you know, we are kind of agency almost. Um, and we do try to um, do a bit of matchmaking um, when we can. Um, so yeah, I think Axis is a good place to look. Um, none of the other portfolio websites quite cut it. Saatchi Online is all about selling. It's huge, you know, there are thousands and thousands of artists on it. Um, I looked at the Crafts Council's directory, which is, you know, it's okay, but um, you, you can't really see the work. Um, terribly well, whereas on Axis things are, are really well documented. Um, so, you know, look no further. <laughs> um, you can select by um, open invitation or else you can tap a few shoulders, you know, select from, a, you know, identify people you're interested in and then invite them to submit some sort of proposal or um, response. Um, and you can always, of course, talk to colleagues, colleagues working in a local authority, curators and other organisations and, and other people who have a specialist knowledge of the visual arts. Um, so I think it's always worth um, doing a bit of um, uh, consultation before you embark on a, a project with an artist. Um, I mean, employment practice is something just to be aware of, and again, this is all, uh, in a way, self-evident, but artists are self-employed, um, you know, so that means they don't get sick pay, they don't get a pension, <laughs> they don't get paid for their holidays, um, and, the, you know, their time is money, and they, they do need to be, to be re you know, remunerated for their time. Um, and rates of pay depend um, on a number of things, but I, I mean, I suppose stage of c career, reputation, things like that do obviously enter into the calculation. Um, if you have a look on the AN website, um, there is a kind of ready reckoner, which um, gives you some indication of the kind of level of fee that you might um, uh, want to think about. Um, you know, insurance might or might not be an issue. I, d I don't know what, you know, it depends really where you, where you what your um, organisation's employment practice and, and expectations are, but, you know, some organisations might require artists to have public liability insurance or something like that. Um, um, and it is always good practice to have some sort of contract that really just sets out expectations um, and milestones um, and also includes a payment schedule. Um, and then something else that's important to think about is copyright and ownership. Um, you, you know, if an artist is creating a body of work, who owns it? Um, 
is, does it belong to the artist in the end or, or does it belong to the museum? And uh, I mean, I guess in most circumstances it belongs to the artist, but, but you know, sometimes this can become a little bit blurred, especially perhaps if an artist has created something with other people. Um, and I'm thinking back to a, a, a case a few years ago, which I'm sure some of you might remember, where Tracy Emin made something with a group of children in a primary school in London. Do you, some of you remember that? And um, I think it was a kind of textile hanging or something like that. And um, uh, long after the project had ended, the school decided that it was going to sell <laughs> this thing in order to raise money. Um, and uh, Tracy Emin was um, uh, intervened and, and told them in no uncertain terms that they couldn't um, because she claimed kind of authorship of the work. You know, she said it wasn't theirs to sell um, and uh, it all became very um, unpleasant um, and, you know, generated quite a lot of sort of nasty um, publicity. So that, that's just something um, to, to bear in mind. And then looking at this relationship from the other side, um, from, from the, the artist side, um, just bear in mind that museums are often part of a larger administrative structure, quite often a local authority. Um, and they do have rather kind of complex recruitment and financial systems so things don't um, don't happen very fast and you know you can be made to wait for payment and um, I suppose my advice is just be, be patient you know these are often very large bu bureaucratic structures that you're dealing with and um, uh, you I'm sure will will find that you're working with people who who you know who want the best and are doing their best but they're often working within certain constraints and can't always provide exactly what you want um, when you want it. Um, so, I mean, uh, again, you know, as in any project, it's all about, you know, establishing a really good relationship. Um, the creative process is a di dynamic one. Things are bound to change. Um, dialogue is essential and you just need to be willing to understand you know, each other's requirements and the kind of constraints within um, which um, other people are sometimes um, working. And behind the scenes at the museum, um, uh, conservation issues uh, and security uh, do loom very, very large. Um, obviously, you know, you may have to wear the white gloves. Um, you may have to be accompanied in the stores. Um, you won't necessarily just be let into the stores and uh, let, let loose. Um, um, large institutions are very, move very slowly. They're often extremely territorial as well. Um, so the people you're working with um, may be enthusiastic about the project, entirely sympathetic to what you are trying to achieve, but that may not apply to everybody in the organisation. You know, it may not apply to the front of house or security staff, for example. Um, may not, you know, the keeper of social history might be right behind you, but the keeper of archaeology might not be. So these are the, just the kind of, you need to be willing and able to kind of negotiate these um, complexities. And um, as in any um, uh, aspect of public life these days, health and safety is, is a huge concern. Not, not that you're very likely to be doing anything that um, uh, has much risk attached to it, but but you know, you, you, some sometimes that's the the case, and um, it's worth just um, keeping in mind. 